Okay, so welcome back. We're uh, second video in a, a series talking about uh, polynomial regression. In the first video, we just talked about simple linear regression and saw that for a, a clearly uh, nonlinear data set that it you know fit better than random, but clearly was showing some systematic errors. So now we're going to move on to our simplest polynomial, which is a quadratic regression. So here I want you to focus first on uh, the return here under call, which shows how we structured the formula here. So we used LM because, again, this is a linear model with respect to the, the slopes and intercepts that we're trying to estimate. We have one thing on the left-hand side of the tilde, uh, y, and then we have two things on the right-hand side, x and x squared. Uh, the important no uh, notation here is that I didn't just do x squared by itself. A reminder that that kind of caret symbol there is interpreted as you know a power, uh, but I embedded that x squared in this i, and that i function uh, is used in our equations, and it forces R to ex evaluate that expression literally rather than interpret it as part of the formula, because uh, as we'll get to. Um, in, in the next series of videos on interaction terms. R would, you know, will in, interpret uh, multiplication uh, in equations as interaction terms. <clears throat> so we're forcing it to interpret that literally, and uh, we get back again our standard set of residuals, and we get back uh, our intercept, our slope, and the uh, coefficient in front of a slope in front of our x squared term. Uh, we can see that this is highly significant for all the parameters, and we can see that our r squared uh, went up. So just as a reminder, in our simple linear model, everything was significant. The r squared was about uh, 74 percent, and now by going from a linear model to a quadratic, it went from 74 percent to 93 percent. We're doing quite well. Um, And here's how that best fit line looks. So you can see that this is doing considerably better in terms of its overall fit. Um, we can, you know, in, in one of the latter videos in this series, we're actually going to come back and calculate the AIC uh, for these two models to actually do a, a formal comparison between the, these two. But just eyeballing it, you would be uh, much more inclined to be the, believe this quadratic model. So let's look at some of the regression diagnostics. Um, so first, uh, our residuals. So here we can see that uh, even though we um, have a much better fitting model with far smaller departures in terms of the magnitude of the residuals, we actually there is some hint that there might still be some trend here. Um, Honestly, you know, if this was real-world data, I probably wouldn't be super worried about this point 0.2 up here because, well, on the one hand, it could indicate uh, a systematic departure. On the other hand, it might just be, you know, one random outlier. And you know, if I just squinted at the top of this top half of this data set, you know, I'd be like, oh, you know, these six data points are pretty good in terms of their residuals, and then there's this one outlier. I'm so I might not worry about that. But if I came back to the other side, you know, I do see this kind of in, in the low part of the data, almost a consistent trend, much more consistent trend of uh, you know, uh, positive residuals at the lowest values when x is negative, uh, then trending towards negative residuals after that. So, so particularly the low end, we might not be uh, getting the best fit. Our uh, residual error looks, our normal QQ plot looks fairly fine. You know, it's a little bit of departure in terms of uh, um, outliers a bit farther than expected, particularly with that data point two and 36 are the two most ex you know, two extreme data points on the ends show a little bit of departure, um, otherwise not bad. And then our scale location plot, uh, you know, not the trend line isn't perfectly flat, but honestly not super horrible in terms of uh, there being a clear trend in the variance. So the variance does seem relatively, relatively constant. Cool. So 
a much better fit, maybe not a perfect fit, but you know, considerably better than the later model. Um, again, we can use the predict function uh, with the same x nu as before uh, to make uh, predictions. And it's nice that we don't have to actually modify that x nu because R actually was smart enough to realize that um, the i function applied to x raised to the power of 2 is not a new variable, but just uh, a transformation applied to the x that it already knew about. So we use predict to get our conf interval and our predictive interval. And then we use lines functions to add these lines. And we can see that uh, all in all, this is looking pretty good. The conf interval shape doesn't have that kind of classic hourglass shape quite as strictly because it's now polynomial. We do see that we still have uh, generally more confidence about the mean towards the center of the data set, less towards the ends. Uh, yeah, and you know, generally almost all the data falling within that interval estimate, except maybe this last highest point there. Uh, and and all, all in all, a much tighter uh, comps interval. So if we think about the width of this, uh, sorry, much tighter predictive interval, I should be clear about that. The comps interval is probably actually slightly wider because again, we're now estimating more parameters uh, so there's less conscious about, conscious about any one parameter, uh, but the residual error has gone down, so the overall predictive error is lower. So we think about, you know, we haven't done model selection yet, but if we think about it intuitively, we're likely to see uh, a, a favoring of this model because we've had a, a net reduction uh, in predictive uncertainty. So we think the residual error is going down faster uh, than the uh, parameter error is going up. We'll show that later. Cool. So now I'll, I'll leave that there and pick up in the next video thinking about higher order polynomials.